This podcast episode is for educational purposes and not intended or implied to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment for either yourself or others, including but not limited to patients that you are treating, if you're a practitioner. Please consult your own physician for any medical issues you may be having. Welcome to the Holistic Psychiatry Podcast. I'm Courtney Snyder, a physician and holistic adult and child psychiatrist. In the last episode, I talked about inflammation, including how our hormonal stress response can trigger mast cells in the body and microglial cells in the brain, thereby interfering with neuronal communication in the brain and causing symptoms. Such brain-related symptoms can include brain fog, fatigue, depression, anxiety, mood swings, and for some, hallucinations. In this episode, I'll talk about many ways we can lower brain inflammation. Whether we have brain inflammation or not, we live in a world that is increasingly inflammatory. More toxins and toxicants, more insults to our microbiome, more stress, more insults to our self-worth from marketing and media messaging. Add to this the reality that many of the things that lower our stress response and thus inflammation are being chipped away at less human connection, less silence, solitude, and stillness, and time in the natural world. But we have choices. Supporting our brain and well-being is really about getting back to the basics of our humanity and getting back to things most of us long to do anyway. This episode has a warning that comes with it. We can approach the list that I'm going to include with an openness to ideas of which maybe one or two may resonate, or we can approach it like a to-do list, one that reinforces the idea that we need to fix ourselves so we will be worthy. My hope is for the former. We are all already worthy and deserving of feeling healthy. The list will generally move in the direction of what I think most of us can benefit from, so this will be the first four. Additional considerations that may be helpful for those of us with brain symptoms will be number five through seven. And lastly, I've included tools for those of us who are dealing with very high immune reactivity and or mast cell activation syndrome. This list will not be complete. I hope you'll find ways to share with me and others what is helpful for you. Number one, the basics. Sleep. Our bodies and brain need time to rest, recover, and restore. Most adults tend to need about seven to eight hours. Too little or too much can contribute to inflammation. Many people will find that they feel best with a routine, even through the weekends, and when they avoid sleeping in. Exercise. We were made to move. Exercise inhibits brain inflammation, increases oxygen to the brain, helps with detoxification, and lowers stress hormones. But overexertion for many can be inflammatory as well. Regular light to moderate exercise is preferable to being sedentary, feeling bad about that, and then overexerting ourselves intermittently into inflammation. This may seem obvious, but this pattern of pushing oneself too hard, having worsening of symptoms, and then falling off a routine is fairly common. Building in habits can require self-restraint. Pacing and managing stress. Stress isn't all bad, but we need to be conscious of how much we can tolerate. I see many people who are thriving until their stress response was pushed beyond what their body and brain could manage. Remember, overwhelming stress can trigger brain inflammation and even prime or make more reactive, inflammatory cells in our brain. Many of us who are especially driven have had to learn the hard way that to be productive, we actually need to do less and not more. Number two, addressing our thoughts. Our thoughts can be impacted by how inflamed we are, but our thoughts can also drive a chronic stress response that adds to inflammation. Our baseline thoughts about ourselves, our lives, the world, can also be determined by our temperament, biochemistry, attachment experiences, and messages from our families, communities, media, and marketing. 
Thanks to neuroplasticity, we can do something about this. So first, we can learn to make self-care and self-compassion a priority. Fixing ourselves is stressful and unsustainable. It drives home the idea that we aren't good enough. An intention to care for, nurture, and be compassionate with ourselves is what creates positive change. Don't forget that adulting or tending to responsibilities that aren't necessarily fun is self-care as well. We can learn to befriend our body, learn to be present, grow healthy relationships with appropriate boundaries, serve others through meaningful work, because futility is stressful. We can practice gratitude, embrace uncertainty, exercise the right hemisphere, which many of these strategies do. Of these ideas about changing thought patterns, I'm including in the newsletter links to various uh, podcasts or newsletters or blog posts that I've written on these topics. Number three, diet. Despite everything you'll see out there about anti-inflammatory foods, I don't believe there are good universal recommendations. What is anti-inflammatory for one person can be inflammatory for someone else. That being said, I would tell anyone with brain symptoms or anyone who wants to thrive that removing or significantly limiting sugar will help them feel better. Most people with brain symptoms will also benefit from removing or significantly limiting alcohol, gluten, and dairy and eating whole and organic food as much as possible. Because problematic microbes such as yeast, mold, and parasites and even certain problematic bacteria thrive on carbs, paleo and ketogenic diets are helpful for many with brain symptoms, as is intermittent fasting. Number four, address nutrient status. Because I've discussed copper-zinc imbalances, undermethylation, and pyrrole disorder in other episodes, I won't focus on those here. Those who are vulnerable to inflammation and those with nutrient imbalances impacting neurotransmitter function, are overlapping populations. Nutrient protocols to address these imbalances are beneficial for neurotransmitter functioning, but also lowering oxidative stress and thus inflammation. Number five, grow self-awareness, but not too much self-awareness. Often, but not always, episodes of brain inflammation are co-occurring with other symptoms but in the body of inflammation. More often, these involve the skin, gastrointestinal tract, bladder, or respiratory tract. Noticing waves of inflammation can help make sense of what's happening and can provide an opportunity to identify and decrease triggers. Was it a lack of sleep, too much stress, a certain food, too many carbs, overeating, too much EMF exposure, or exposure to mold. This can be tricky because if we're limbic, which I'll get to, and excessively focused on controlling and avoiding triggers, the stress of this pursuit can add to the inflammation. Recognizing and avoiding triggers ideally is something held lightly, an opportunity to lower inflammation while getting to the deeper sources of inflammation. Again, this is all about balance. Number six, address toxicity. The more oxidative stress we have, the more inflamed we can be. Oxidative stress is when our protective antioxidant system has been overwhelmed. Though any toxins or toxicants, so EMF is considered a toxicant, can drive inflammation, in my experience, mold toxicity, because the way it disrupts the immune system, is the most common cause of mast cell activation and high immune reactivity. Number seven, access the vagus nerve. This approach is more about accessing calm and lowering inflammation using our body, a bottom-up approach. The vagus is what takes us out of fight or flight and puts us into rest, digest, and engage. It also plays a role in stabilizing those inflammatory mast cells. Passive approaches include regularly putting our body in a safe place where We have removed ourselves from things, people, and spaces that can lead to stressful thoughts and states. Examples could be meditation or walks in nature, 
Another passive approach is having positive social interactions with people we trust. Neuronal pathways of social engagement involve our neck, mouth, face, middle ear, and throat, which together access the vagus nerve. Active approaches include things like deep breathing practices. This could be block breathing, alternate nostril breathing, the Wim Hof breathing technique, Singing, chanting, humming, even gargling can access the vagus, as can postural shifts. So this might be dancing or other movement, yoga, even contemplative practices that involve kneeling can access the vagus nerve through barrow receptors in our vascular system. Stanley Rosenberg's book, Accessing the Power of the Vagus Nerve for Anxiety, Depression, Trauma, and Autism, has exercises that I often will recommend. Addressing structural issues impacting the vagus, such as upper cervical instability, which I've talked about in a previous episode and I'll link in the newsletter, is also helpful for some. Number eight, stabilize mast cells. Remember, when they are destabilized, they release all those mediators, some of which lead to brain inflammation. Not everyone with brain symptoms needs to have mast cells stabilized, but for some, this can be very helpful. My two favorite supplements include quercetin with or without bromelain and CBD oil, which has been shown to be helpful for depression, sleep, anxiety, and pain, likely in part because of its mast cell stabilizing effects. Mast cell stabilizing medications include catodophen and chromalin sodium. When it comes to mast cells, magnesium and vitamin C can be important supportive nutrients. I find clinically that optimizing zinc levels plays an important part in stabilizing mast cells and lowering inflammation. For those who are so reactive that they can't tolerate any supplements or medications, accessing the vagus nerve and limbic system retraining, which I'll talk about, are both very helpful in calming that immune reactivity and thus brain symptoms, and when used, can allow someone to then move forward. Number nine, lowering histamine. Histamine is just one of the mediators that mast cells release, but one that can further trigger mast cells to become activated. While histamine can cause a lot of well-known physical symptoms, skin issues, upper respiratory allergies, it can also cause brain fog, fatigue, depression, and addictive tendencies, especially for those who are undermethylated. We need methylation to break down histamine. If we could completely stabilize mast cells, antihistamines would be less necessary. They can, however, be a good tool to use initially for some while identifying and addressing root causes. Supporting methylation in those who are undermethylated can also be helpful and make antihistamines unnecessary. Removing additional sources of histamine and thus inflammation can also be helpful. For one person, this could mean lowering respiratory allergen exposure, using air purification, an allergy mattress and pillow covers. For someone else, this could mean lowering high histamine foods or taking DAO or diamine oxidase supplement to break down histamine in the digestive tract prior to a high histamine meal. High histamine foods, which don't impact everyone, include products of fermentation, so wine and other forms of alcohol, vinegar, soy sauce, yogurt, kefir, kombucha, but also dried fruit and leftovers, especially leftover animal protein. Beef, because it goes through an aging process, is higher in histamine than chicken, for example. Avocado, cinnamon, citrus, and tomato products are also high in histamine. Number 10, limbic system neural retraining and trauma therapies. The limbic system is the part of the nervous system that alerts us to threat. It is involved in vigilance. In addition to our genetic vulnerability, if we experience trauma and or toxicity, mold toxicity is a common trigger, and that response becomes stuck, we can go into a state of high alert where many types of stimuli can cause our physiology to feel threatened. This can cause mast cell activation and inflammation to ensue. If we're limbic, 
we may be regularly scanning our environment or body for threats. This can result in excessive attempts to control our environment or the state of our body. Programs that can be very helpful for this and in calming mast cell activation and brain inflammation aim to retrain this aspect of our nervous system. Examples include the Dynamic Neural Retraining System, or DNRS, the Gupta Program, and Primal Trust. Primal Trust also incorporates vagal toning and trauma-informed practices in addition to limbic system retraining. These programs can be done online. Trauma-based therapies such as EMDR, too, can be very helpful in decreasing this inflammatory cascade. If, like me, you tend to be driven and or perfectionistic, it's important to check your mindset. Do you feel a sense of urgency to do all of these things? Or are you able to look at the big picture of healing and thriving? To notice what, if anything, resonated, looked interesting, or even fun, and go from there. I'd love to read what helps you with your mental clarity, energy, stability of mood, and sense of calm. If you're reading this by newsletter, please consider commenting. And if you are interested in getting these newsletters with text and audio in your mailbox each week, please consider subscribing at CourtneySnyderMD.com or on Substack. Until next time, take care.